So uh, this is Akshay and my name's Eric and for our FYDP we decided to design quantum dot enabled organic phototransistors with an emphasis on medical imaging and sensing, uh, specifically fluorescence based medical imaging and sensing, hence the name fluorosense. So over the next bit I'll go over the background of fluorescent medical imaging, the problem, the solution, all things about the design including the fabrication, uh, the physics behind it and how we tested and validated against the customer requirements. So fluorescence medical imaging is an old and a new science. It's long been known that certain molecules can absorb light at one wavelength and emit it at another. Nanotechnology has allowed us to manipulate these special molecules for purposes such as medical diagnosis and, me medical diagnosis and treatment. So it differs from radiology in the sense that radiology is more for um, deep tissue analysis, whereas fluorescent medical imaging is for surface phenomena, making it useful for pathology detection and guiding therapies. We've also identified uh, you know, four different types of surgical fields that we feel if they were able to implement fluorescent medical imaging into their existing procedures, uh, they would reap a lot of benefits. And of course, uh, there's money to be made. We've identified three markets here where our uh, uh, design could possibly exist. And as you can see, they're quite sizable. So even if we were able to capture a small sub-portion of those markets, uh, there'd still be a monetary incentive. So let's go to the patient level to understand how this works. So for fluorescent-based medical imaging, you have a patient and you want to look inside of them, essentially, uh, in a non-invasive manner. So you would inject these uh, biomolecular tags and markers that fluoresce through the skin of the patient. There's an external detector, typically, that is able to pick up on those fluorescent uh, signals and produce, a, um, and produce an image that ultimately allows the physician to view the inner anatomy of the patient. The problem is, when those markers and tags that are injecting the patient bioaccumulate, the patient might experience be a little nauseous, might have some headaches, and in more severe cases, cardiac arrest or difficulty breathing. Today alone, we've already spoken to four different people who've kind of seen our poster and they can relate to that. What does that tell us? We need to lower the amount of these biomolecular uh, tags and markers that need to be injected into the patient to still produce a sufficient optical signal. So, when we were thinking of a solution, we looked at this process and said, okay, where can we intercept the pro problem? Well, a lot of research has been done at this part. So you can look at different types of biomolecules that may not cause those adverse side effects or even targeted delivery. But for us, we decided to focus our efforts on the detection methods. So ideally what we realized is we can make the detector so optically responsive or more optically responsive to those fluorescent agents injected into the patients, then you wouldn't need to inject as much, thus reducing the risk of those types of adverse side effects. So phototransistors are a type of detection method uh, used to pick up on the fluorescence of those biomolecular tags and markers. Fundamentally, it's a device that can switch or amplify an electrical signal based on optical input. So how do they fit in? Well, uh, when, they, when the fluorescent agents in the patient emit light, the phototransistor picks up on that and actually changes the current that's conducted through this transistor. That detectable change in current allows the physician to actually image the fluorescent, the fluorescent agents within the patient's body. So we had to figure out, um, I want to explain to you how we came up with a solution. It's three things. We identified a problem. We understood that we need to improve the responsivity of those detectors using medical imaging. Number two, we had hypothesized that quantum dots can be the charge carrier generating source within the phototransistors when illuminated to create that change in current. And finally, um, a trend. We know that technology advances exponentially. And you know, if this were a product that were to go to market, we want to make sure that when it does, it's not too behind the curve. So the type of trend we want to build upon is organic electronics um, that reap the benefits of being lightweight, cheap, and in certain cases, flexible. So now that we understand what we want to build, we want to make sure uh, the device we build is suitable for its application. Uh, the three primary customer, uh, customer requirements pertain to the, oper the functionality of the device uh, relative to the sp specific application. So number one, we need the transistor to conduct a usable amount of current when illuminated. And when it's illuminated, you, are, you have to be able to see a distinct difference between the on and off states. So there's no false positives. You've got to be able to tell, is it detecting the fluorescent agent or not? And finally, responsivity should exceed 1,500 amps per watt, which is kind of the commercial standard for um, types of detectors currently used for medical imaging. For secondary primary requirements, uh, photo response time should be between 1 millisecond and 10 milliseconds. Photo response dictates, um, you know, can you do live imaging with these types of devices? Can you use it for surgeries? Number two, the device needs to be operable in different types of temperatures. We chose negative 50 and 80 degrees because that's um, what we've seen 
um, currently being sold in the market. Most transistors work within those temporary ranges. We want to make sure ours does as well. Uh, number three, the transistor should only be active for a specified and predicted wavelength. Now that's important because you want to make sure whatever detector you make, it detects what you want it to detect and not just any type of light. And finally, the device should be robust. So this is an image of, our, of the device we created. Uh, this is a wafer with all the different devices patterned on top of it. Uh, well, they're the same device, just 52 of them. If we zoom in, we can see uh, kind of the structure of one of the devices from top to bottom. At the bottom layer, we have an aluminum gate electrode. Uh, we use aluminum because it's easy to work with, easily sputtered, highly conductive as, as an electrode and relatively cheap. And then a silicon substrate. Now, silicon's not organic, but um, we were very, we're, our group is very comfortable with using it uh, in microfabrication processes. And you know, since, once again, since it is only a substrate, it's easily substitutable for an organic um, substrate in second generation devices. The silicon nitride layer acts as a dielectric to create capacitance within the, the device. And on the top layer, we have an aluminum source and drain electrodes. And in the middle, we have kind of our special blend of a P3LT polymer mixed with quantum dots. And there, we try to leverage two things. One, the conductive uh, properties of the P3LT polymer. And number two, the charge, charge carrier generating characteristics of the quantum dot. And I'll explain later on how they work. So <coughs> this is our device. And photons of a certain wavelength illuminate the channel. When they illuminate the channel, the quantum dots, the electrons in the quantum dots get excited to the valence shell. And when that happens, you add more electrons to the delocalized sea of electrons that already exist in the polymer matrix. So essentially, it's a dopant, but a light sensitive dopant, which is important for our application because you only want, when there's more electrons, there's more current, but you only want that to happen when it's illuminated. We did come in some design challenges. Um, then the first one is figuring out what is the ideal polymer concentration. So, as you know, with a higher polymer concentration, it meant increased viscosity. But what does that mean for the customer? Well, that turns to ease of fabrication. If the viscosity is too high, you can't spin coat it. If it's too low, when you try to spin coat it, you'll probably just fly off the wafer. So we need to find that middle ground, and we found it to be five milligrams per milliliter um, after testing their various concentrations, as this produced, um, it was the easiest to spin coat, and it produced a good quality film. So now that we've figured out you know, how much polymer is the right concentration, we have to figure out, okay, now what's the quantum dot to polymer ratio? With more quantum dot, with more quantum dots, you get more charge generation, but the more quantum dots you have, uh, it gets a little bit more difficult to spin coat because inherently quantum dots, uh, they're not very good for spin coating. And what does that mean to the customer once again? Well, more charge generation means a larger conductance change when illuminated, and spin cone compatibility ultimately affects the final quality of the film. Now, combining all these trade-offs together, um, you can kind of see the balancing act we had to deal with. You know, lending more towards a higher QD ratio, um, you get a larger conductance change. However, it lowers the quality of the film. And then for, in terms of finding where like, it's easy to spin coat, you kind of have to find that middle ground. So finding the middle ground between all three of these different properties was kind of the main challenge we had um, in our overall project. And I'll hand off to Akshaya to actually explain um, how we made it this. Hi, thank you, Eric. So our fabrication involved three main processes. The first one being the synthesis of the quantum dots. The second one is the synthesis of the quantum dot and polymer solution. And finally, the mi microfabrication of the entire device. I will be going through this in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. So first, we synthesized our cadmium selenide quantum dots with octadecene as our solvent. However, P3, we discovered that P3OT was not soluble in octadecene, as well as the fact that octadecene had a very high boiling point, which made it in, unsuitable for spin coating purposes. So instead, we chose to go with chloroform as our solvent, um, since it had a much lower boiling point, which made it ideal for spin coating, and also had the advantages of being able to dissolve both of our polymer and quantum dots. So we redispersed the quantum dots in chloroform, and proceeded to add an appropriate mass of polymer to that to create our final spin coating mixture, which when spin coated, we expected basically to produce a polymer matrix with quantum dots within it, as shown in the last purple image over there. Um, when it comes to microfabrication, we started off with an N-type silicon wafer, double side polished, since we had fabrication things happening on either side. Um, we started off by depositing silicon nitride using plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition followed by which we DC sputtered aluminum electrodes on the top and bottom surfaces. The aluminum on the top surface needed to be patterned into source and drain electrodes, and to do this, 
We performed it using photolithography with this photo mask. It is intended for a three inch wafer and as you can see has 52 devices built into it with enough clearance between them. Um, we chose to go with this number of devices to allow for enough redundancy in case we came across issues. Additionally, the channel length that we chose to go with between the two electrodes was 100 micron based on research. However, a lot of the devices were um, designed ranging from ch channel lengths starting from 60 micron all the way to 140 micron with the intention of possibly testing this parameter if um, needed during our second generation of fabrication. So once photolithography was performed, the excess aluminum was etched away using pan etching. And finally, we spin coat our polymer quantum dot solution onto the top surface. Um, some things we considered were spin speed, timing, baking temperature, uh, and time when looking at the spin coating properties. And so eventually, based on experimentation as well as research, we chose to go with a spin speed of 900 RPM for one minute, followed by an hour of baking at 60 degrees Celsius in a vacuum oven to ensure that the film had properly adhered onto the surface. Followed by that, we basically scratched off the polymer on the source and drain electrodes to expose the aluminum at the bottom for electrical contact during testing. Um, we characterized our polymer quantum dot film as well as our aluminum layer um, using an optical profilometer to measure the thickness as well as obtain an idea of the roughness of the film. As you can see, the polymer thickness was about 385 nanometers and that of the aluminum was 550 nanometers. The main reason we did this was to be able to correlate them back to our fabrication parameters to see how we could fine tune those to change these in case we needed for our future um, second generation devices. So as Eric mentioned earlier, these are our primary requirements and I will basically be taking you through how each one of these was considered in our design, the physics behind it, as well as the test results that show how we validated each of them. So the first one was that we needed our channel to conduct when illuminated and so to do that we need to somehow reduce the resistance of our channel when light is shined upon it and for that we need to introduce more accessible electron states in the case when illuminated. So this is done by adding quantum dots, which provide the additional electrons to the sea of delocalized electrons within the polymer. We then probed it using a probe station and tested at various gate source and drain source voltages. We chose to go with negative seven volts gate voltage and a one volt drain voltage for this test. Um, we measured the current through the device in the dark versus the illuminated state and plotted it against time. And as you can see, the current has a difference of about 15 milliamps in the on versus the off state and we, we were able to achieve a signal to noise ratio of about 188, signal being the 15 milliamps and the noise being the standard deviation in the little variations we see in the signal. Apart from this, we also hope to achieve a high responsivity. So responsivity is the electrical output produced per unit of optical input um, by the device. And so this relates back to the resistance of the channel and here we came across a trade-off regarding channel length. So a larger channel length means we have a larger channel area to illuminate and therefore more current produced. However, it also means you end up increasing your resistance. Decreasing that channel length would end up meaning you have a, more of a tunneling dark current and so you might not be able to see a distinct on and off current. So at this point, we chose to go with 100 micron based on research that we performed. But as I mentioned before, our photo mask did include designs with other channel lengths in case we weren't able to attain this target with our 100 micron channel. So we then performed testing, applied a one volt drain uh, voltage followed by sweeping the gate voltage from zero to negative nine and measured the current through the device when illuminated. We also measured the incident optical power on the channel area alone and used that to calculate the responsivity. As you can see, going towards more negative gate electrodes, uh, gate voltage allows us to go towards higher responsivities and we reached a maximum of 1.78 times 10 to the three amps per watt um, at negative nine volts. And so we definitely met the requirement within the 100 micron channel itself. Um, similarly, for our secondary requirements, we looked, uh, we were hoping to achieve photo response times of a few millis, uh, on the range of a few milliseconds, and we therefore calculated the rise time, which is the time taken for the device to respond to illumination, and the fall time, the time taken for the device to respond to the removal of illumination, and calculated it to be about two to three milliseconds respectively. Um, similarly, we tested the device um, at negative 15 degrees Celsius by placing it within a freezer and then probing it right after hoping to keep the temperature as similar as possible. And we also did it at 80 degrees Celsius by putting it on a hot plate to heat it above 80 and then probe it, hoping it would have cooled down to 80 by the time we tested it. And we didn't observe any significant change in operation, just a slight change in signal to noise ratio, but nothing too drastic. Um, we were hoping to achieve a device that was active for a specific 400 nanometer wavelength. 
However, our device only worked with a broadband light source, and we were not able to achieve this wavelength selectivity. This could be because the quantum dots tend to absorb all energies higher than their band gap, and so there was, with the current design, there's no way to cut it off to a specific 400 nanometer range. And finally, our device was robust. It was able to withstand four hours of continuous testing with multiple optical um, switching cycles that we put it through. Um, a point to note is that one of our devices did fail at gate voltages of negative 10 volts um, and lower than that. And this could be possibly because at that point, the signal, uh, sorry, the device was conducting a gate current that reached one amp and l overloaded the power supply. So we could have melted the silicon nitride layer at this point regarding the device um, unusable. So for safety purposes, we didn't go past negative nine gate voltages during our testing. So overall, if you want to assess how we did, uh, in terms of primary requirements, we did satisfy all of them, so that's good. In terms of secondary requirements, uh, we weren't able to satisfy the, the selectivity for a specific wavelength range. Uh, but overall, I think uh, you know, uh, six out of seven uh, deemed our project a pretty good success over the, over the last eight months. Uh, so what did we learn? Well, we learned that we were able to demonstrate the potential of organic phototransistors uh, in, for medical imaging applications, and we are able to see how quantum dots can improve the responsivity uh, when illuminated. Uh, we were able to display adequate photo response speeds, which means that our device could potentially be used for live imaging practices. And finally, um, our device is adaptable to different types of environments, temperatures, and overall we found it to be robust. Uh, next steps would be to investigate how we can actually satisfy that, wave, that selective wavelength requirement. Uh, that's important because, once again, you want to know what you're detecting and not just detect any type of light. Uh, fabricate second generation devices so we can test different types of aluminum and silicon nitride thicknesses. Uh, that way we can hopefully obtain uh, a higher gate voltage and ultimately get more responsivity. Uh, miniaturization of the device is always good because so it's going to be integrated in a different type of system. Uh, that would help with power consumption. And finally, uh, figuring out a different way to deposit the P3OT polymer would be good so we can have clear aluminum electrodes, which would be um, good for more stable wire bonding. This is the team. Um, Pal will be joining us shortly for the Q&A. Tabby is outside on our poster. You should definitely check it out. We'd like to thank the following uh, professors and lab instructors for the help throughout uh, different portions of our project. And a special thanks to Dr. David Corey as our project consultant. Thanks for your advice and expertise. Thank you, and we're ready for questions.